Uh, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm with Charlie Corey. I've heard it so many different ways. Well, nobody actually knows how to pronounce it, even the Corys. <laughs> and Joel Myers. Yeah. It's May 20th, 2022. We're at Linfield University Library talking about their history and the history of Charles Corey. So take it. Yeah, so I was talking about my family. You know, I don't know. They say good biography starts with actually grandparents, but uh, my dad's parents um, uh, both uh, were both immigrants. Uh, my, my grandfather was born in France, but his father, Emile Curie, uh, was a Frenchman. And so my, my, uh, my, grand, my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mother, was nobi Hungarian nobility, and his, her father was Baron de Pastry. And so f they had no heirs, male heirs, and so they convinced Emil Curie to be adopted. So his official, after his adoption, his name was uh, Emil Curie de Pastry. And uh, my grandfather was born in 1898 in uh, Paris, but my he had an older sister, Lily, which is this picture. Uh, he um, apparently, we found out after my grandfather's passing that he committed suicide, had not died in an influenza, as my grandfather had under, had told mm. my dad, um, and that it was some bank uh, scandal involving the Panama Canal. The French started building it first. And he was involved with it somehow, and we don't know. I got someday. I got to dig out the history of my great grandfather because it caused a lot of suffering uh, in, in his family. So my grandfather was moved by his mother back to her family in Hungary. So he was raised in Hungary, um, and, and but moved for a few years back to France uh, after World War One, <clears throat> and his sister with his sister, she ended up staying, marrying a Frenchman. But my grandfather immigrated when he was 25 to uh, the United States and dropped the de Pastry name. He, he felt, I'm going to the land of democracy and I don't want to have, he was sort of a closet socialist communist. Maybe not so closet, I don't know. Uh, so he dropped that and uh, came, he, he studied art. Uh, he was an artist, draftsman, did work in lace. And so, um, but he had a green thumb, and I think that was important for my grand, my dad's future because uh, my grandfather just loved loved plants. And uh, even though he was doing lace design in the city during the depression, he uh, got a uh, got a farm out on Long Island and grew flowers, mm -hmm. and uh, on the side. He just loved flowers. Well, he was kind of a tough guy to get along with. He's a little bit like my father. I'm, you know, you, my, my, he was an interesting guy. Uh, you met my grandfather. Here's my grandfather in his old age. Here he is. Uh, here's another one of him. Pop. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that is an amazing photograph. Yeah, this is in his older age. Isn't that great? Doesn't that remind you of him? Yeah. He was a woodsman. Uh, he, my grandfather, uh, there was one bicycle store in L.A. In, after the war that sold 10-speeds. Uh, they were all English. He bought one when he was 55 and rode from L.A. to Vancouver, B.C. and back, smoking all the way. That's the kind of guy he was. He was a really good, really good painter. He was an artist, yeah. yeah. You have pa pastels, some, if I remember right. That's right, oil pastels, yeah. And... Uh, but, but I think you know he, he struggled. He had some, some baggage from his uh, childhood and was a pretty harsh person. So my grandmother, who had her own baggage, uh, she had been essentially abandoned uh, in Hungary to her grandparents during the war and was stuck. And her father was a uh, fairly affluent American banker, also from Vienna, and. Uh, it took a while to get her out of Hungary after World War I, and they stuck her in a, um, a uh, finishing school in Switzerland so she could become properly uh, socialized. And she told me, 76, she's sitting on her bed with my wife and I, she's 76, and she's talking about that, and she starts crying as she recalls her mother 
who she really didn't know. She had been raised by her parents. This uh, beautiful, rich American lady came over, who was her mother, and left her in this boarding school in Switzerland. And she said, I was standing by a picket, white picket fence, and she turned around and walked away. Uh, kind of really, really. So she had her, she had her own troubled you, there's a f funny family story where uh, my grandfather was very demanding on how the quality of goulash, which is a staple Hungarian food, and she tried everything, the best potatoes, the best meat cut. She said, I tried everything. One day I had the little kids and the, the goulash burned, and I just, I was had it. I didn't have any more energy, so I served it up. And apparently my grandfather said, Finally, it tastes just like mother's. <laughs> she used to love that story. Anyway, so I think that, so they divorced. And my grandmother wanted sunshine, moved out to Southern California uh, before the war. Beautiful orange groves in those days. Uh, all the sunshine she wanted. And my grandfather realized if he was going to have a relationship with his boys, he needed to follow. So he actually followed, and they both struggled and so my grandmother tells the story uh, one day he came into the kitchen and said to her Elise you're a good businesswoman because her father was a banker she had a natural sense with money uh, if you want me to help you with the boys financially uh, I need your help I want to start an, uh, a floral shop will you help me and so they went into business together these two couples who couldn't really get along <laughs> She did the books, all the invoicing and everything, and he did the floral arrangements. And it was on Wilshire Boulevard, downtown uh, LA. But again, I think that, you know, it just had an influence on my dad, even though he was kind of raised in, you know, Los Angeles as a boy, uh, being around the floral business. Um, apparently when my, my uncle, who was two years younger than my dad, graduated from high school, my grandma, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and they stopped the floral business, which I'm sure was a little hard on my grandfather. Um, and uh, the, other, the other part of the story, I think, too, in that pre-war era was my grandmother. My mother, she was born in 21. She was 10 years older than my dad. Um, he was born in 31 in Trenton, New Jersey. She was born in Columbus, Ohio, 1921. Uh, and... Um, her parents, my, uh, divorced, um, and apparently with the, my, my grandmother had an affair and the new husband and her wanted to, they were some, somewhat affluent, uh, part of, um, Columbus took off, wanted to spend a year in touring Europe together. How about that? Talking about scandal. And so they, t but they took my, my mom, I don't know why my grandfather let, let them, I, that's another mystery I don't understand, but they dumped her into a French boarding school, one of these finishing boarding school, when she was 10. And she didn't speak a word of French, and dumped her in there. And that's where she started her French, so she became very fluent with French. And then during her high school year, she went to uh, a lot of Ecole de Champlain on the Lake Champlain up in uh, Vermont, which is a French-speaking. So she spent her summer speaking French. So her French was very good. And I, I think that the, even though she wasn't an immigrant like my dad with that connection to Europe, the fact that she'd been in France and spoke French was another European sort of orientation that they both shared and, and, and had, uh, which then led, I think, to why he ended up going to Alsace after his graduate, to finishing up his graduate work at UC Davis. Um, so he, he graduated, I think, from UCLA. He got an NROTC scholarship. He's a bright man. And so he, he, he won a scholarship and uh, ended up going to uh, uh, UCLA. Um, and. Uh, and then when he got out, I, didn't, I did not realize this until my children started talking to him about his life, that he was actually a, um, a Korean vet. I did not he know He was this. a meteorologist in the Navy, wasn't he? Well, he, he 
his degree in UCLA was meteorology. Yeah. And I asked him one day, Dad, why in the world did you do meteorology? He says, you know, I, I needed a major. I was like a sophomore and I walked out one day and I looked at the clouds and it was like, it seemed interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I knew he was a meteorology guy. Yeah. I thought that's what he did in the Navy. No, he was an ensign for, uh, he, he commanded a flotilla of landing vessels. That was his assignment. Oh, I thought he was a weatherman or something no. on a boat. No, no, no. no just a, <laughs> just a, I think he ended up a Lieutenant JG or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't realize he was a vet. He was actually fought in the war. They, they landed, they landed and picked up Marines off the thing. <laughs> he never shared that. No, I thought he was a. Yeah, no, he said he. Yeah, he, I saw he, a picture of him in a marina in an outfit. One yeah, time. yep, and uh, he, uh, late, you know, so he's talking with my sons about his experience, you know, and he's talking about smelling the gunpowder on the Marines. Mm -hmm. He still remembered that coming off, and the, they were just, you know, PTSD just drained. What year was he born? Thirty-one. Yeah. So he was younger than my dad. Dad was in Korean War. When was, to, your, when was your how, when was your dad? Twenty nine, and dad was over there in the Philippines, but he never went to Korea. Never went. There. He was in the Navy. They were they talked Navy stuff. They did. Yes, I remember. But that. he was building air bases. Right, because he, he he was a a, a old, CB. Yeah, CB. Yeah. 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 Was he was your dad doing engineering work? Was he, was, did he, did he do engineering, a civil engineering after, after he got After, yeah. he was a bulldozer operator yeah. and he was in, and that's what made him want to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> Tucson, his yeah. dad's name was Tucson, what a great name, Tucson Myers. It is a great name. Yeah, huh. he, he was, yeah, huh. he, yeah, he, he definitely intimidated me yeah. as a boy. <laughs> but later I really came to appreciate him a lot, he was a, a great guy. Um, and uh, so he got out of the Navy and he, I get, he needed a job. And so he ended up getting a job with uh, Julius Weil. So Julius Weil, they don't exist anymore, but they were a, kind of a premier importer out of New York. That's where their headquarters importing really high quality uh, alcohol beverages, you know, so the, you know, Bollinger Champagne, you know, top of the line, Drewer, they had Drysack Sherry and uh, um, some of these really high quality wines they were bringing in. And um, in fact, Julius Wilde taught for, he, the guy, this son, was also Julius Wilde, taught at the American um, Gastronomic society for a long time. So they were really into that kind of thing. And so my dad, uh, there's a picture of him somewhere here. I'll try to dig it out. Yeah, here, here, here's, here my, here's my dad at UCLA with uh, his boss. Not UCLA, at Julius Weil, his boss and some of the folks that, from Julius Weil. Back and doesn't this guy look like a sales guy? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could remember his name. He used to come up, when he'd pick up my dad, he'd honk the horn and go, da 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 which meant, um, I'm here to pick you up, Chuck Corey, big jerk. <laughs> <laughs> my dad always got a kick out of that. Uh, they had a good time. So they, they uh, he uh, met my mom. I think he was still in the Navy when he met my mom. And uh, they ended up getting married and uh, moving to Laguna Beach. So they're in Laguna Beach, that's where I was born. Well, I was born in Newport Beach, but they lived in Laguna Beach. They didn't have a hospital then. And uh, so he's working for, for, for uh, Julius Weil. And he ends up going, he, so he told me, he goes to uh, Lloyd and Elwood, which was a, they had two high-end liquor stores in uh, West, uh, I believe in those days, West uh, uh, LA. And, you know, that's a place where the movie stars went to get their yeah. wine and their champagne and stuff. And so he would call on them, and he was talking with uh, Elwood, Mike Elwood, I believe his name was, one day, and he said, uh, he, he told me, well, he, he uh, challenged me one day about, well, Chuck, you know, you can either sell wine or you can make it. And for some reason, that little seed just got implanted, maybe because of my grandfather growing 
different flowers and stuff, but that little thing. Well, in, later I, I learned that Mike Elwood had himself been challenged by somebody with the very same proposition. You know, Mike, you can either sell it, you know, all this stuff, or you can try making it yourself. And so actually Elwood ended up, but in those days he wanted to make some really good sherry. That was what drove him. So he ended up buying some, uh, some land up in San Luis Obispo and trying to make, so it's sort of, so this sort of, but somehow my dad got caught into that era, and this is maybe mid 50s, well 56, 58, 59, and. Uh, but that was happening in the, in the United States. That's was starting to happen. Yeah, that's right. They were starting that little. The wine industry was starting to turn. Yeah, yeah, in the fifties. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then, um, so apparently somewhere they were. My wife, my mom, and my dad were traveling in Carmel, apparently, and they were in some hotel room, and they just decided, you know, let's let's try to figure out, let's make it. Let's not just I don't, let's not be, just be a salesperson. And uh, yeah, those were funny days. I remember he told me a story. He used to fly back to New York for the big yearly powwows with Jewish Weill. He said they would drink like three martini lunches. Uh, and it, it would just put him under. He didn't know, he could not keep up with these New Yorkers. He didn't know what to do. So he, he, he finally got into us. He finally figured out, what, this is what I'm going to do. So he'd say, they'd come for lunch and they'd order the, you know, what drink do you want? He said, well, actually, I'm on the wagon right now. So that was his way of saying, yeah, I'm such a heavy drinker, I'm kind of cutting back. <laughs> and that sort of got it. <laughs> he always, that was, I don't know why he thought that was pretty funny, that he could, that was his way of not having to get put under the table by these heavy drinkers. order order wine instead? Well, no, he did, so I'm not, didn't order anything, because he said, I'm on the wagon, I meaning I'm, I'm cutting back, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm off alcohol for a while. Yeah. Just, I'm, you know, Detox, I'm, I'm, detoxing. De I'm detoxing, yeah, right now. That would be the modern equivalent. That was his scheme to keep the New Yorkers from drinking them under the table. I mean, now nobody drinks, but I, can you imagine a three martini lunch? Uh, that was the, the, the rigor. Right? That was, yeah, it was, that's what you did. <laughs> Uh, so, so then they, you know, how are they going to do this? And so they decided, well, the way to do it, he had to go learn. Uh, I don't know why. I, I, I suppose I take after him that way. He wanted a theoretical underpinning that was important to him. Um, rather than just like Richard Summer had the same idea and just moved up and started planting grapes and, you know, in the Umpqua Valley, my dad wanted to get some a little more background, so they, that's when we moved to Sacramento. So he could go to UC, uh, UC Davis, get uh, viticulture with, uh, he studied under uh, Winkler and Amarine, um, were the, kind of the two main forces in those days, down, down at UC, and, uh, and so then that's where, uh, yeah, so that we moved up, moved my mom. Across the street. Yep, my mom was a nurse. And um, uh, so she went back to work. Shirley, right? Shirley. Shirley, yep, she went back to work. He did a little bit of work for Julius Weil, but not much in Northern California. Mostly he just focused on his, uh, his work. I don't, I don't remember him studying particularly. I mean, I remember, I remember we had, uh, we didn't have a TV. You guys didn't have a TV either. You had a TV. No, not in Sacramento. You rented one when you got the month. Yes. And we didn't have one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we did, man. And then yeah. your mother infected us with the mumps so we could all get the mumps at the same time and we got to go watch your TV. Yes. We didn't have a TV till, my dad didn't have a TV till after I left home to go to college. I come home and he's got a color TV and I go, what's that? <laughs> you had a TV your whole life. We'd go to your house to watch color. No, we did. we did on TV. We didn't have a TV until I was 10. I know. but And that's when my grandmother thought we were being abused, so she bought us a TV. Yeah, but it was color. Yeah, we, we got never it. had one. We We'd go it. visit you and watch that's football right. on that television. My, yeah, we inherited that from my grandfather. <laughs> Had a color TV. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we were talking about that. My 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 wife's mom is a 
was a nurse, and uh, but she was she did not like her kids getting sick. But we loved getting sick because my mom would do stuff like get she a would TV. Run to the TV, yeah. <laughs> I was a big deal. man. We're sick, yeah. <laughs> we could stay home and watch the TV. mumps and the measles. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. So we we spent a couple of years. Yeah, I remember so many memories playing Civil War down at the baseball, throwing dust in the air. Remember that? I don't, the what? Civil War. We do you remember we used to play Civil War and for some reason. Civil, because we'd play all kinds of war, World War II, what, but Civil War required, you had to go down to the baseball stadium, and you know the, how baseball has that fine dirt? That fine, yeah. we'd throw it up in the air and just get covered with dirt. That, some reason the Civil War, I always was impressed, had to have, you don't remember? No. Yeah, yeah we used to throw it up in the air and like we're making, I don't oh, know, bombs, bombs and stuff and that. get covered with dirt. And then my dad had uh, been a bugler in Boy Scouts, and so he would go out and blow the bugle. We could hear it all over the neighborhood, and so that would be time to come home for dinner. Uh, he we, had, caught, we caught the Easter Bunny. Yeah, we caught the Easter Bunny. A rabbit was loose, and we found it out in the yard, and so we swore it was Easter. We were not very old, so we caught this rabbit. And we brought it in and we took Charlie's mom and we said we caught the Easter Bunny and so she went along with it for a little while and then uh, we figured out that it was this, it was a German guy's down the street rabbit. <laughs> so we had to take it back to him. <laughs> and uh, so we learned what the word Hassenpfeffer, which is uh, a German word for rabbit stew. <laughs> That's what he was, he was going to do with yeah, it. I but, remember uh, that. Yeah. yeah. So it was not yeah. it was not the Easter Bunny. <laughs> yeah, polywogs. I remember that riding down and uh, yeah, we had some. That was, yeah, it was a fun neighborhood. I remember we, you and I, were the two bo kids, boys typically you'd imagine, who refused to do the hokey pokey in kindergarten. I don't know if you. Remember I don't that. remember that. One. Yeah, they, they, we, they were going to do the hokey pokey for some parent thing, and you and I were not going to humiliate ourselves with a hokey pokey, <laughs> even at five years old. I don't know what that, what we, what we ended up doing with that. I don't know. We probably were forced to do it. But well, we didn't. We didn't. Apparently that's good. Parents, yeah, we didn't. So there, we're still I striving still for dance. our dignity. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, so, yeah. Uh, so then he, uh, towards the end, so he uh, had this uh, meteorology background and I think Winkler, I mean, if you read Winkler's book, uh, he's... General Viticulture. General Viticulture. Which I'll bring up later, but yeah, that's okay. He, uh, he talks about climate in there, and they, they had already developed, I don't know, six or seven climate... Regions, yes. Regions. Yes. So I think that that was really important part for my dad, Winkler's work on, on regions. And so my dad started thinking about the connection a little more clearly between the fine wines that he had would, had been yeah. selling, many which came from uh, cooler climates than California. They did a lot. They did quite a, a couple of uh, German wines, and they had a champagne, of course. They had, I think they had a Chablis, obviously a Burgundy. So. I, th I think he, and what I don't know is where he came aco across uh, th the Thornthwaite evapotranspiration potential index. Uh, I, d I don't know the story of how he came across that, whether Winkler got it to him or where he found that, or maybe that was already happening in his work, at U at his school work at UCLA. I don't know. But Thornthwaite had this very clever, I always thought, clever way of indexing climates mm -hmm. by measuring the uh, evaporation because it simulated what's going on for a leaf. Mm -hmm. And I, it's because you, it, it, you, in that one index, you get day length, temperature, humidity. I mean, it, it just, it's a great index for, for, and a fairly simple measurement to make. And so they were able to, he was, Thornthwaite was able to start measuring using his evapotranspiration method, different climates. And so my dad got a hold of that and started thinking about different wine regions or different re uh, climate re reasons, regions built around that index. And that was pretty, 
I don't know where he got that. I, I don't think I don't know whether that was, I don't think it was Winkler, but maybe it was Winkler, or maybe he had already had it at UCLA. I never I don't I, I don't know. Do you know? No, you no. Uh, and so. Um, so he started working on this idea that uh, maybe the uh, length, of the growing season, how long fruit has to ripen, has a relationship to its quality, whether it's grapes or strawberries or anything, right? If you ripen them really fast, they're not going to have the same organoleptic flavors as if they ripen slowly. No, it seems kind of common sense. Like, gosh, I don't have to be a scientist to think, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Kitchen logic. Anyway, so he, he started thinking about that and realizing when you look at the har when they start harvesting grapes, you know, their end of September, all these regions are harvesting at the end of September, uh, and the, the varietals that are um, in those regions are been cultivated to, to ripen in that way. I mean, they, I, they could have, I mean, they could have, and it's always a bit of a mystery why the monks didn't breed grapes that ripen at the end of August. But they didn't. Make it easier. It would have made it easier. They didn't have to worry about rain or rod or, rod or, rod or, or anything. Yeah, they but, were always but, on the verge of disaster. Yeah. <laughs> Which maybe had to do with they wanted they they were after higher quality wine. I don't know. That's kind of you got to ask the monks that question. It's kind of an interesting sort of. But that he but he, he just he just noticed that uh, that was the the issue. The other probably though is I'm guessing grapes naturally were not conditioned to m make wine in more northerly cool climates, and so they they had to breed for. You know, they had to take what they could get, and they normally right and kept working them to to that way. I don't know. I'm not a geneticist how that works, but that there you could make a hypothesis about that. Anyway, so that's what he 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 got thinking about that, and so he he wanted to. That was his, you know, uh, dissertation, which you probably have. I'm, I'm thinking. Two or three uh, yeah, on the on the. Um, you know, varietal selection based on on climate. Um, there's a <laughs> there's such a great story. I don't know why. I think it, it it's kind of a, a, a phenomena where the followers become more of any guru, any teacher. You know, like the followers of Martin Luther or the followers of Calvin are even more intense than the original. I don't, it just kind of seems. Because I remember, you know, I grew up, it's all about climate, it's all about climate, it's all about climate. So after high school, I went to study in France uh, at the same research center what my dad did. And uh, doctor, I don't know if you've heard this story, but Dr. Uglin, uh ended up being asked to take, he was the director in Alsace, but he was asked to take direct uh, supervision of a research center, little one, in Sancerre, which is over the mountains uh, 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 west of Burgundy, at the tip, at the north of the, at the mouth of the uh, Loire River, as it kind of goes south. So I was took a trip down there with uh, Monsieur Balthazar uh, when I was there, and uh, we went with the, the director. I can't remember his name to visit a, one of his wine growers, and it was this beautiful. Cellar. I can just remember it had clerestory windows with a big arch with oak barrels, and it was all filled with uh, so, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, which is the variety they use there. And they were the proprietor was testing, in a playful way, testing the director if he could tell what soil the Sauvignon Blanc came from, because they have three types of soil that go through that thing, and they could he could tell the difference. And of course, the goût de terroir was, I had always, you know, I'd grown up, no, nah, it's got nothing to do with soil, it's all, and I, so I had like this, you know, like any person does growing up, you, you, you realize your dad didn't have everything right. Uh, but actually, I, it was probably my interpretation. I don't think my dad ever said soil had nothing to do with it. He just said climates, you gotta go there first before you go to, but I took it as, I took it kind of over the edge. I remember being sort of my, my worldview kind of got exploded when I, like, that's not supposed to happen. Anyway, 
Uh, so he got into the climate thing. So he he wanted to go to um, uh, study wine growing uh, uh, in Europe. And so I think maybe through Winkler, he had a connection through the INRA, Institut National de la Recherche Agronomique, there uh, 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 in Alsace. So we ended up moving in 63. First grade, right after. Yeah, right after first grade. Yep. So we could, we could date that, 63, 62, 63. And, um, we could have stayed in Colmar, but they wanted a more French experience, so they picked a little village called Riboville on the on the Vosges, the Route de Vin along the Alsace, and uh, that's 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 where we live. So he would commute into Colmar, and then my mom and we uh, didn't have very much money. I know that, and um, we lived on the Rue de Juif first and then moved to the Rue de Tenner and uh, um, yeah so he you know we we traveled a lot we went and saw uh, the Koblitz a couple of times they came to visit us because they were in Vadensville which isn't too far uh, up the, you know, up the Rhine that's Werner Werner okay. yeah what was, what was the relationship to him Werner and Emily Emmy had come to study at Davis while my dad and Dave Lett were studying there and so I remember we invited them to the 4th of July picnic what's that we invited them to the I remember going. they came to your house in Sacramento once yeah on a 4th of July once that's right so technically I met him then huh? I remember that I remember that, that 4th of July that Pan beating war we had with you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> yeah it's funny because Dave Latt came to visit. He spent a month with my dad, and they traveled around. And Dave was here, and they they had the they were there over the Fourth of July in Alsace, and they started a parade down the little village street. <laughs> they got a little a little tipsy, had all the kids following him. I remember that. They had a good time. There's a picture somewhere in here of Dave and his German girlfriend visiting. Uh, before before Di he met Diana and um, so how did how did Dave know your dad before that uh, they went to they were in school together yeah Dave never I don't know why Dave never graduated I don't know the history there you'd have to ask Diana um, I think he just I think ran out of money or just I don't know I don't know what happened there with his his school at Davis but um, they came and he he also traveled on his own on that trip, but they, they spent a good month traveling together. Went to Burgundy, I remember, um, traveling around and uh, talking. My, my aunt claims that um, Dave was a hard uh, convert to the climate theory thing. Um, that's my aunt's take on it. Um, that they, she remembers them arguing about, you know, in a discussion, he, you know, discussion um, about you know where you where it would be the best the varietal selection thing that my dad was into, but I think Dave eventually came around obviously because they sort of they came up together essentially they they realized that two is better than one, or they have a good return on their labor is an old proverb, Jewish proverb. I guess it's in Ecclesiastes, but um, and. Uh, so yeah, they were that, they were they were really it was really close. I mean, Dave was like a, a brother at that point. Um, they later had a falling out for a variety of reasons. Diana thinks it had to do with the, the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. My dad was very conservative. You know, he'd been a military guy, and Dave became very disenchanted. And uh, you know, believe it or not, politics can ruin friendships. Mm -hmm. It really can. It's hap I mean, look at COVID. Sheesh, COVID. You know, vaccination and vaccine. You'd be surprised how man it's mm -hmm. caused problems in my family. I don't know if it has yeah. ours. So, you know, you think, gosh, why would they let that happen? But things things happen. It could have been under under underpinning jealousies. You don't know, but. Uh, um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, because I remember how disappointed I was because Dave, we would, my brother and I would go and 
spend time with Dave, kind of, because he was like an uncle. So my brother got to spend a weekend with him, and then it was going to be my turn, and then they had started having this falling out. So I never got my weekend with Dave. <laughs> 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 I always said that. I was so gypped about that. Um, but that, that happened later. Um, and uh, uh, so we went, we went to Alsace, and he really finished up his, his uh, dissertation. And then we came back in 64, and we were in Sacramento for a little while. And then uh, you had problems in second grade. You couldn't. You couldn't. That's right. So you couldn't. You had problems in school. I did because I couldn't. So you couldn't speak English anymore. No. Or read and stuff like that. I, yeah. You yeah. were in a different class. I was. I had, they had to take me. You back. were remedial. Yeah. I, I was remedial. That's what I, I remember. That's I was. I could write because they teach you how to write in first grade in France. But I couldn't, I, my English was all screwed up. Yeah, I did struggle. Not that you were academically depleted or anything no, like but that. I, I definitely struggled. Um, uh, definitely struggled. It, I think it was hard on my brother, too, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, my mom wishes that they would have put him back a year. But the school said, no, don't do that. Because he went through the same thing. He, they dumped him in. He couldn't speak French. Yeah. I mean, I remember, like, going off to school, like, I couldn't speak French. I mean, I came home crying, like, what is going on? <laughs> well, what really uh, used to go, I mean, Mademoiselle Wintermantle was my teacher. And you, the boys, it was all boys, and the girls went to another school in elementary. And you'd present your hands. If they were dirty, she'd whap them with her ruler. Ruler, ruler yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, many years later, uh, I took my family back, hmm, maybe six years ago now to visit Alsace, and I took him to Rivoville, and I went to the house where we had rented the Scheidecker family, but it was the Scheidecker name. I mean, it had been 50 years, but it, it said the Fut family, and so I thought, well, they've moved, or who knows what. So I, I was going to buy some foie gras for my family, because I want it's a specialty of Alsace. I wanted them to taste it. I'm sitting there in the book. Uh, at the, at the butcher, and he spoke, when I spoke to him in French, he spoke with that very distinct Alsatian accent, as he was an older guy. And so I, I got, oh, you're, you're, uh, I'm, I'm visiting, I, I, I haven't been here for 50 years. So we got to talking, and I, and I was sharing, well, my teacher was Mademoiselle Wintermantel. And he goes, well, that's my teacher, too. That was my teacher. She was my teacher, too. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, I'd gone. I tried to look up the Scheideckers. Uh, but they're, they're not there anymore on the Rue de Tanner. And he says, no, no, no. That Fute, um, Jean-Vierre married a Fute. And so uh, uh, Alice Scheidecker is still alive. She's in her 90s. You need to go back and, and visit them. So I, oh, OK. So I went back, and I rang the doorbell. And a girl comes out. And I said, I'm looking for uh, Alice Scheidecker. And uh, so she just a moment. And then a woman comes out. And she looks down. And she says, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, jean -Vierre. She had 13 when we were there. She had a crush on my brother. <laughs> and I, uh, I said uh, later, so we're crying. And she'd come up, and they open a special bottle of uh, Gewurztraminer. <laughs> <laughs> and Alice is still there. She was and they had a picture of my family on the wall. Can you believe that? That's amazing. We had such an impact on them. Yeah. We never really wrote. We lost touch. But they still had a picture of my family. It's incredible. It is. And uh, I said to jean Vieve, like, how did you recognize me? He said, well, I knew you were an American. And who would be asking for Alice Scheidecker but a Khoury? And it, it was either you or your brother. And it, I, it wasn't your brother. <laughs> so it had to be Char Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom got very close to them. And, and really, we dove into the French thing. and. Um, uh, I think, uh, so when we came back uh, in 1964, 60, uh, my dad wanted to find some vineyards to plant. And he looked around, actually. He took all these Thornthwaite climate. They went out to Ohio because my mom had family there, of course, maybe. But in the end, he felt that Oregon had the better uh, climate for the varietals he wanted to grow. He wanted to grow 
you know, Riesling, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris. Those are the, those northern, uh, the French call it septentrional, the northern uh, varietals is what he wanted to do. And I, th I think he was talking with Dave at that point, and they, they decided. So my grandfather and he went up to look for property. Uh, and uh, it was a big storm. It wasn't the Columbus Day storm. I think that happened earlier, but it was, I remember it was a big storm in October. It was probably right after Columbus Day storm. Yeah. Maybe it was right after. It was right after. Yeah. And uh, uh, ended up finding this, this property. Uh, they were uh, selling it. Uh, it went down the hill across uh, Gales Creek Highway and was down on the plate, and he didn't want that because he wasn't going to grow uh, vines down there. Later, he told me, yeah, I should have just bought the whole thing, but he didn't. Anyway, I don't know how they, they borrowed and borrowed and from friends and everything to put up some money, family and everything to, to get to buy the place. It had no electricity or water, so we had to live downtown. Um, uh, Forest Grove for almost nine months because it was the house was unlivable. I mean, it was there were no windows. They'd cut floors in it. Black bear. I mean, you can see the pictures that Dave Lett took uh, of the original house. I mean, this this is what it looked like. Um, let's see, yeah, here's some some of these pictures. There's a few more. You know, just. They, they were growing, they put burlap, they were, had grown seed potatoes in the place. So they'd cut holes in the floor to aerate it and darken it so they'd sprout. <laughs> it was just, and there was no, yeah, no water, no electricity. So they, he had to get that, he had to get a place livable. Plus he was working full time. He was bivocational, so he had a job with, uh, he got a job with Oregon Fruit Products yeah, uh, down in Salem. So Dave, uh, uh, Mark Gaylor, Gave him a job as a sales manager. I suppose based on his, you know, his Julius Weil work. Um, and my dad was really, actually, was really proud of that. He he did some, you know, I think had a big influence on me because uh, my business uses independent sales reps. Has for, and my dad really appreciated brokers, food brokers. They're called agents. They're paid a commission, but they're really you sort of outsource your sales to these guys. And they're they're very capable, and shrewd people. And uh, he was he he did a lot of things, but he, he he said I got to a point where I was begging Mark to make anything. He'd sold he'd sold everything that they have. I don't know if you're Oregon. It's still in the grocery stores. Oregon fruit products. He had sold everything. Uh, he'd moved it all all across the North America. And uh, so he, at one point he was working like four days four hours a day because. That just everything had been sold. Uh, he was he 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 was he when he was when he was on he was really he was very capable. I mean, so not just in growing through, but just in figuring out how to go go to market. Um, so he he was he he was giving that his full attention, right? That job plus trying to get the vineyard going. Um, you know, there's, argue, there's debate about, you know, Dave or him who planted the first Pinot Noir. It's, to me, it's kind of a weird debate. I mean, they came up together. Dave planted some cuttings for them down in Corvallis because they were going to plant to, I mean, I mean, who, who, you know, I, I, don't know why, I don't know why that argument or that discussion exactly comes up because they, they were in it together. They came together. They had been to school together. They dreamed of what could happen in Oregon together. Um, Did you plan on Monday or Tuesday? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. Well, was it noon or yeah, one? So you know? they, 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 both, they both put their chips on the table and went for it. Uh, they were young enough and uh, had the energy and decided we're going to give this a whirl. Um, the, uh, I mean, we had, I remember, I remember the old prune boxes because prunes were big in Oregon in those days, so there was prune boxes and everything was in prune boxes. So I had the cuttings with the sawdust coming up and planting. And my dad, you know, because it was still experimental, he, he wanted to plant a lot of 
for experimental varietals. So if you go up to there to David Hill now, there's just, you know, there's all kinds of, there's things like Pearl de Chuba, yeah. <laughs> which is on Semillon, Riesling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, half rows of different varietals that he was, you know, he didn't, didn't, they didn't know exactly what was really going to work. And so there was, there was a lot well, of Well, what they did plant worked. Yeah. And that's 55 years later, they're still successful. People fight over those grapes because they, that winery sold some of those fruit rather than make it themselves and people fight over it. Mm. Yeah. Well, you'd know that. It's, well, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Versus a few years later, growers, it's one of the things I thought of is people planted uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and things that didn't work. What was planted at, at what your father planted were things that actually did work and, and are still working uh, half a century later, I, which I think is uh, noteworthy. Yeah, I, th I think he really, I mean, he- Hit the mark. Yeah, I mean, he, he knew that Cabernet Sauvignon wasn't the right varietal. I mean, his whole thesis was a varietal selection. Yeah, the other ones failed miserably, yeah. and, and these did, did not, have not, and have worked well, well and made exceptional wines, yeah. and still are today. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so, so that, so we, we uh, so eventually, you know, big adventure. I remember my aunt, Aunt Betts, uh, dry, she told me the story that she, when my mom, because she was in California, came to visit, and drove her to the house, the, the David Hill house. And my mom was so excited about all the possibilities, my aunt started crying, because it was so, I mean, blackberries, she just like, one of these old houses that you see driving, it was like that. I mean, this is a, this thing should be torn down. <laughs> uh, that was so funny. And they had very little money. Uh, it takes a lot of money to start a, a vineyard, and so they would do kind of one room at a time. So you'd get the windows, it was a big deal when we could get rid of the plastic. The guep room was actually that, where the wasps were. That's where, right. That's <laughs> right. Guep is, a, is yeah. wasp in French. That's right. So upstairs, <laughs> it's called the guep room because there was a huge thing of wasps up there when we <laughs> moved in. Uh, but it, yeah, it was, a, it was an adventure. We had an old. Old, I think I got hepatitis probably from the old well when I was in high school uh, because we this old well pump thing, my dad had to, it's amazing it was still working, that he could get it working, but he got fired it up and the, somehow found the piping and it was way down the hill. I tried to tromp through there and find it, but it was, they've, they've, they've gone and logged everything uh, a while back. I couldn't quite find it. Um, down below the old barn. Yeah, quite yeah. a way. Yeah, down. It's down there. Yeah. I, I was down there not long ago. Okay. Yeah, it's there's a still, spring. There's a spring. Yeah. Yeah, a natural spring. Not a lot of water, but enough to for a house. It wasn't enough to, to eventually he needed to uh, he <clears throat> that's maybe down the road, but he, he started to as he um, he uh, so he got offered a job with some other canning company, and it was a big promotion. We got, he got a big car, it like doubled his salary. So he took that job, and uh, it lasted two years. And he, I don't know what happened. They fired him, or they downsized, or you know, corporate changes. So they had a big fork in the road. What are we going to do? And they decided my mom would go back to work as a nurse. And he'd get into the nursery business growing grapes. And uh, he had started out initially with Dickie Rath growing grapes. It was so amazing, the two of them. They got going, growing grapes, and they built this greenhouse out of wood, plast plastic everything. They right built, by built, the house. By the house, yeah. built the whole thing. And the thing that was most amazing to me was my dad's misting system. So they were doing uh, um, leaf. What do you call it? Do any plant? Green, leaf? yeah, little green, green little green, green cultivation. Green right cultivation, little pieces. But he had, a, weren't they like IVs? Well, no, he had a he had a mister system, but he made out of wood a teeter totter, and he put it was so simple. He put chicken wire and a paper towel on the chicken wire, and on this side he put a mercury switch. 
solenoid. So when the thing would go get dry, it would go up, and the mercury would go here and turn on the solenoid and miss. And then it missed, and it would go up, and it would turn off. I just thought that was so ingenious. I don't know where, because these are the days before the internet. You can't just go Google it, right? He, I don't know where he learned that, but he figured it out. And, and uh, I think you have little IV tubes going down to each plant. No, no, nah, maybe, I maybe just later. Like a bunch of tubes. I remember going in there with him. Yeah. Well, I do. I just remember the, his homemade Mister thing. Uh, that was good. And then yes, eventually, mispropagation. Yeah, mispropagation and the, the green leaf. That's the term. To blow up the varieties, because so you can you can take a green a shoot and cut it at each node and then put it in there. And then in the That's, sand, and it will. The roots will go, and then you put that in a pot and grow it. So you can really multiply. Meat, you can really blow up a variety. Yeah. So yeah. Like rapid propagation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yep. Rapid. It's propagation. not really tissue culture, but it's mispropagation is the next step down in vegetative propagation. Yeah, that's his specialty. Uh, and then they, they so D Dick and my dad sort of parted ways. Uh, I think my I think Dick found my my dad challenging, which many people could. Um, and so he, my dad ended up uh, getting a big nursery in uh, near Gresham. There was an old nursery that he he ended up renting, and um, they they went to town. I remember when I was 15, starting to deliver grapes. I had my drive, my driver's permit, <laughs> pulling a trailer with, with Guy Rulin, yeah, delivering grapes all over Oregon, even into California. With the we had a we had a Jeep pickup and a rented a had a trailer and loaded it up and and he with, with pots and so um, and so uh, that uh, the. the yeah, so that, that's, so, and, but also at the time, I think that he was really trying to, I mean, Dave um, Adelsheim really remembers this part of my dad. It's a little less obscure to me, but they were always meeting. I don't, the, the, the Oregon Wine Growers Association, they were always having meetings. And, at your house? Well, all over. They would, yeah. they would go all over. Well, early on, it, they were more going to each other's house. Okay. Early in the early early days, I mean, there weren't that many of them. Uh, you know, and, I remember them meeting at his house when we'd we'd go stay the spring vacation yeah. at your house or yeah. something like that. We swapped back and forth, but I remember that's where I met Mr. Erath and Mr. Ponzi and yeah. Alice and Mr. Fuller. I mean, when I was a little, I was a little kid. Yeah, that's where I met those guys. Yeah. But they'd come and yeah, that's right. And you'd so, be in the other room watching television. They'd be in the room next door. You just screaming at each other. You could hear them there. Yeah. We're not talking. Yes. That was the foundation, the that was the, the TWAR, but the Table Wine Research Advisory Board with those guys. That was the, now it's the Wine Advisory Board or the Wine Board or whatever, but that was, at that time, that would have been the early 70s. That, that, yeah. yeah. But they were hashing it out. <clears throat> Yeah, they were hashing it out, and I, I, I think, you know. Label rules and uh, yeah, what, what, rules, all they were like. What are we going to do? They were, what are they going to do? How are they going to get this going? Yeah. Yeah, and I think they were, they, they were all committed. My dad was really committed, too, to, to building an industry. And so they, they spent a lot of energy on that. Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the the tonnage. My dad was to put you know the tax on the tonnage to try to fund research. That was one of his things. Yeah, the ton the tax. Yeah, they were all setting the rules up for all that, and yeah. then the labeling rules, how they were going to do all that. Those were all done by those guys at that time. Yeah. Why do you think they? With so, with so few people involved at that point, it's such a long ways in the future to think about it being an industry. Why do you think they were so confident in the need to lay these lay the groundwork? Then why do you think they thought it would take off? Well, me because I think they really believed they could make great wine. They really, I mean, maybe that was arrogant, but I think they thought, yeah, we're going to end up making great wine. We're going to have a this. This is real, real. 
we're going to make better wine than California. That was kind of their, <laughs> their, they had a little, a little, not a chip on their, maybe a chip on their shoulder. I don't know. California was the big bad. It was like corporate. It's like, I'm going to start something besides corporate. So there was a little, we're going to prove this. This is going to happen. And we really can, well, make, we believe we can make great in wine. In 72 was a really good year. They made yeah, some great wine in 72. They made great wine in 75 and 76. What, now, what year did Dave win the big thing in 75, France? 75, but he didn't win that until 79. Okay. But I mean, you could tell. I yeah. mean, and several wineries made killer wine in 76. Yeah. But 72, people made great wine. I mean, you knew it, red, red wine. But they were already making really nice white wines. You could do that, I want to say, routinely, because mm -hmm. people in fact made mistakes also. But um, there was a great wine made, a Pinot Noir made in 72. 74 was a little funky, but uh, 75, 76, those were great wines. That's so, because 74 is the year we graduated, so... Yeah, but that was a heavy year, <laughs> kind of light. I mean, no. um, but I mean, you could already Couldn't see. have been a good year, Joel. Huh? That couldn't have been a great year. We graduated. I know. But, the end was um, coming. There was already some good vintages by the mid-70s. Um, so they could see it. Um, whether you could sell it or not, whether people didn't even know what Oregon existed, um, people didn't drink Pinot Noir. No. In America, um, it, they didn't drink Oregon wine, so it was complicated. You didn't you didn't really break when I started in 1980. Pinot Noir was less than ten dollars a bottle. You didn't really break that eight dollars and fifty cent, nine dollar. Can you get ten bucks for a bottle of wine? You know, so yeah, that was tough retail. <clears throat> Retail. So they, but I think they, you know, I think they, they, they wanted to, you know, I think, certain, I mean, a lot of these, I mean, Dave and dad both came from a sales background. Dave led my dad, they had it. So they, they were always thinking that side of thing. They weren't just farmers. They came from, they understood you had to sell something. So they were trying to build a, a brand, I suppose, already at the beginning, an Oregon brand. Yeah, but 78 and 79 were big deals because that was that whole gold milieu thing. Yeah. That's when, um, who was the Chardonnay from California that got this in the same thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. I, I should know it because Joey's friend works there. Yeah. But they won the Chardonnay Award at the same time. And there was, so there was a couple of wines from America that broke the broke through in France, and so it brought attention to American wines and West Coast wines. How could that be that um, these American wines uh, came over here and, and did this? And so it also it would happen for American wines as much, and, and Oregon happened to have one in there. Yeah. And so um, yeah, Dave, Chateau Montalina. Oh yeah, Chateau Montalina. Uh, and so they happened to, they did it I think the year before and then Dave's wine actually did it the second year and so it was a big deal for the West Coast, not only Napa but for Oregon also. And so it it, it became exceptional for the West Coast. And we and then that just changed everything for Oregon. Yeah. I, that changed everything. I think I think too, and this one I don't know. This is a speculation, but I, I think it 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 affects the business I'm in, what's in business. Uh, Dave uh, Jonathan Naisbat wrote a book in 1983 called Megatrends, and he was a futurologist. And in the book, his second chapter, he's got a chapter called High Tech, High Touch, and his thesis is for human beings to accept a more virtual and digital world. They need to counterbalance that with more sensual, tactile um, things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they will actually end up rejecting technology. So, you know, you see an ad for Microsoft, there's always a cup of coffee. Is it a coincidence Microsoft and Starbucks grew up together? So I think a thesis could be made that culturally America was moving towards fine wine, good beer, good coffee, good cigars, good gardening, 
-hmm. you know, Lowe's and Home Depot, all that, that direction of, you know, you're in front of a computer all day and you want to go garden, you want to build something, um, you want to do woodworking, you want to drink good wine. I think that a case could be made that there was, they were riding a, 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 a wave of a cultural transformation uh, that's part and parcel, of, ironically, the technology, the growth of technology. If Naisbet's thesis is right, I, have, I think it's still compelling to me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, it was compelling enough that he wrote a second book that was lousy called High Tech, High Touch. So somebody got hold of that idea. But also, Charlie, what you were talking about earlier is the three martini <clears throat> lunch in the 70s yeah. or earlier was um, the wine that was consumed in the 70s was, was Leap from Milch, which yeah. is Mule de Turgau, which right. was um, Gallo. Gallo. Yeah. Uh, Hardy <laughs> sweet, Burgundy. Right. No, uh, sweet, uh, sweet Burgundy. Sweet, sweet white, sweet Burgundy. Hardy Burgundy. Um, oh, man. Annie Green Springs. Uh, Kind of Mogan David. I'm not talking, and not wines I would know. not choose today. But those consumers yeah. of that time, Miller Turgot was made in millions and millions yeah. of gallons, led those wine consumers to drink oceans of Chardonnay in the 80s and 90s, yeah. and led them to drink finer wines. Those that led those yeah. people to drink wine and and drink less martinis. And so, yeah, I, I, I think, <clears throat> I think so. I think that that led people to drink, led them to drink better wine. Yes, I and think less yeah. martinis. You have a glass of Chardonnay now with lunch, perhaps rather than a martini. Three glasses of gin. Well, my, <clears throat> my so I, I don't know if I've ever shared this one. My dad had a theory about that too. That, um, uh, you know, the United States. I think it still is, is the third highest consumer of hard alcohol after Russia and Poland. Well, why did the United States become such a drinker of hard spirits instead of wine? And well, my dad's theory was it had to do with phylloxera. So with what? Phylloxera. <clears throat> that when they came in the early 1800s to plant grapes, vitis vinifera, yeah. in the East Coast, they had powdery mildew, but they also had phylloxera problems. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't, they couldn't really grow good wine in the East Coast, the high humidity East Coast. Heavy Prior to the rootstock evolution. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and so what did they do? Well, the one, the opening up of the Ohio Valley, how do you get stuff over? Well, you take your wheat and you distill it and make hard alcohol. And so that gets over the hill. So you got hard alcohol without wine becoming part of the meal, like in Europe. Americans became consumers of hard alcohol, especially because that was a, a, a way of transporting wheat across the, the, yeah. the um, Appalachian Mountains to the East Coast. And so we, we became a culture like Russia that wasn't really a wine drinking culture. We were, we were a hard alcohol culture. And, and it got so bad that you have the temperance movement, right? Mm -hmm. Which you never really was just kind of unthinkable in Europe. Like, why would you have a temperance against cheese, you know? Like, or why would you do such a mm. thing? Well, it was because of hard alcohol. Because people were drinking it and getting drunk and families were getting wiped, wiped out. So you got the temperance movement that popped up in the United States. It is like nowhere else in the Christian world ever happened, you know? It's like a weird thing. Well, so he thinks it had to do with phylloxera, was the root is that a pun? The root yeah. problem of why we became, and so it's taken, it took, it's taken a while to unwind that, that thing that developed in the American culture. We still drink a lot. In some years, yeah. Yeah, we still drink a lot. Of, I think we're still number three mm -hmm. per capita in the world. I'd have to, I haven't looked at it for quite a few years, but that was his theory mm -hmm. of what happened. So ironically, Vineland was not very hospitable to wine. Which is kind of irony. Um, that makes sense. It may. I mean, it, that was his his explanation. I always thought Italians it was, just carry cuttings around wherever they go. You can follow them across the Oregon Trail. Yeah, yeah. they're sticking. I uh, know wine cuttings yeah. all along the Oregon Trail. Yeah. You look yeah. for them. Yeah. Why? But then, but you did get like so. He the the place where he bought was a Ruder, a Ruder Vineyard. Ruder had planted grapes there prior to Prohibition. Uh, so it wasn't that it was... Shasla. 
uh, yeah. Was sweet, was sweet, sweet water, they called it. Was a, you can find old plantings of uh, those around, great, around pre prohibit Yeah, pre old plantings of grapes. Really? They called it sweet water up on the hills. Interesting. And it was basically a like a clone of Shasla. Interesting. Yeah. See, I didn't. I would that. imagine that's what that was. Probably. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. And then, but they pulled them all out during Prohibition. Um, that was that was a tough time for the wine business. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to bootleg something yeah. you have to grow. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you're so you're, you're talking about the in the, the 1970s. You have you have him. He's he's, he's working and, and got the nursery business going and yep. vineyard started. So tell us about sort of the growth of his vineyard and business and kind of paralleling with the other sort of startups at the same time in, in the in the area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so he, he planted vineyards and, you know, it takes a few years to get the grapes going, but he started making wine. I remember our first press, he made a press, uh, a homemade press. Um, yeah, he, we, used a, we used a car jack to press it because he made a yoke, big, this big honking yoke with a circular. He had a powder coated metal and he put the wooden slats in a circle. I've got a picture of it somewhere here. Here's my brother. Here's my oh. brother sitting on the little base of it with the cake. You can see the cake. But there's yeah. one here. With, there is one in here. I'll find it. Um, and, and I remember he got, he got totes, old plastic wood, you know, totes with the plastic liners. We put the grapes in there and then we literally, he didn't even have a crusher. So we did the old fashioned feet crush. Yeah. And he pressed it in this little this little press he had with a so he'd sit there and he made a wooden lid <laughs> and just crush the grapes and then break it up. Here's my brother and, and then that's how that was our, I remember that our first our first uh, harvest vendange. Uh, and then it the just, cellar was under the house. The cellar was under and the you house. You got in trouble. You yeah. had the little like a root cellar under that old house yeah. and it was a all fixed up. It was gravel and had your coke drums under there. And that yes. was until the Department of Ag showed up. Oh, yeah. Because the Department of Ag inspectors were from the dairy department. And they were like, this is not a dairy. This is a winery. But it was, uh, I remember going down there and there was like two or three yeah. coke drums down there. It was all fixed yes. up with new gravel. Maybe the walls were painted. I don't remember. Yes. And that was until the Department of Ag showed up and said, "No, uh, -uh not going to, not going to be a winery, a commercial right. winery." Right. And that's when you had to fix up the barn. Yes. Move out there. Yes. Yeah. So I, can, I don't so know I when he bought it. I think it was Bond Winery Forty or something. I can't remember um, when he when he went through the paperwork to get a bonded winery. But I remember it was under the house. Yeah, we, he had some little under root the house. cellar. Uh, yeah, yeah. You couldn't even stand up exactly. Yeah, kind of had to. Um, yeah. And uh, so that, yeah, that was, that, so he started making wine. He was interested in also slow, cool fermentation. That was one of his shticks. He, he wanted to do that. Um, stainless. He had stainless, but he did some in some plastic totes too. No, but not, not necessarily wood. That's right. He was uh, kind of, I don't want to say anti-wood, but he was not really into barrels. Well, he, he tried, he, I don't know whether it was he couldn't afford it, but yeah, he wanted was it those, a sanitation thing. Yeah, he or, wanted those clean, sort which of. Was the, which was happening then. Yeah. Barrels weren't, like now, everybody's into wood. Barrel, uh, there was a thing then where stainless was coming on and wood was, that was a thing that was happening in the wine industry at yes. the time. Yeah. French oak was not the, the way to go at the time. but. Yeah, I think they were, I don't know, I think there was, a, you know, French wines have a lot of uh, vinegar, acetic acid. Not a lot. Enough to make great wine, really, actually, I think. Americans were moving away, wanted really clean wine, wanted to clean it up. I, I mean, that's my take. You're the expert. But What? Well, just that they were, Americans were trying to move away from some of the, the, I, I think also that there's a microflora problem. You know, you, if you think about the European wineries, I mean, the hundreds of years they've got an ecology in those wineries. They don't even add yeast, right? They've just got the right microflora. Yeah. 
but that doesn't you got you got some bad critters in Oregon and so I think I think the reality forced a little more cleanliness yes water sanitation was an issue here way into the 80s yes <laughs> Yeah, and so they, they, yeah. They, 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 that was sort of pushed that, pushed that. But he, he one, of his, one of his most interesting experiments, he had a, a Pinot Noir that people really liked, and he actually used oak wood chips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he got a kick out of that. I don't know why he was, I don't know why he just got a kick out of adding wood and getting a, getting wood. a nice oaky flavor. French oak wood chips. French wood, oak wood, wood chips. chips are great. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, eventually, though, he ended up uh, having a lawsuit. He, he, he ended up not just getting into delivering plants, but setting up vineyards, such as what Joel mm -hmm. de did. He, he became a part of the, he, so he started planting vineyards for people, set up drip irrigation and stuff like that. And he did a big job in Salem. In fact, uh, in between after high school and my travels to France to study, I was his crew boss planting this vineyard up in Eagle Crest in, I don't know what the mountains are of Salem. And he was behind schedule uh, from what he, had, what he had committed to. And they sued him. These New York financiers, it was a sued him. And he lost. Um, and so it just sucked all the money out of their, out of, that he had. He didn't have a lot, but it just pulled it all out. And uh, gosh, I, I couldn't, I mean, you know. 1976. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so he needed, he was going under financially. And that's when David Tepla came. And David Tepla uh, was a, Affluent, I think he had a family, had a hardware store, hardware business, and bought in. He was interested in wine and, and bought in. They were 50 50 partners. Uh, but my dad had so little money, he gave his, his lawyer to, to Brad, I can't remember Brad's last name, he gave him 2% of the business, of his business. And Eventually, Brad and David teamed up and forced him out. Uh, now you could say, "Oh, that's so mean of them." Uh, but I, I, I need to put this into the record because I th this is my story too, not mm -hmm. just his story. Of so um, I had been uh, uh, traveling in France, and when I got back from the United States after two years, I was kind of lost, actually, and um, struggling, what am I going to do? And I had a neighbor, who had a friend in college, I was going to Portland State, Joe remembers this, and uh, we bought some marijuana from the guy. We were getting stoned, and I, I, didn't, I didn't sober up, I didn't come down. Uh, Joel told me later, he maybe slipped some uh, speed into it or something, or I don't know what, LSD, because my friend and I weren't sobering up. So I'm in there, like, not really struggling a little bit with reality. And uh, I'm in the basement at the cafeteria at PSU, and these guys next to me, it was a Friday, and they were talking about buying some Thai weed, which is a really powerful marijuana, for the weekend to get with stone. And I thought, oh my gosh, this, this, it's like, I can't escape this thing. What am I going to do? And so I said, I'm going to call my dad. I'm going to call my dad. We had a good relationship. So I remember going to the phone booth and calling my dad and telling him, Dad, here's what's going on in my life right now. And so he, he said, I don't know why at the time, but later he told me I just what came to me. So that reminds me of the story of Ulysses. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, one of his adventures is he lands on the Isle of Circe, and she's a witch, and she Ulysses is held back at the ship, but his men come and have dinner with her, and she puts drugs in their wine and then turns them into pigs. And Ulysses comes and is warned by Hermes about Circe, and so she tries to do the same thing to him, 
And just as he's about to drink it, he pulls out his knife and puts it to her throat and forces her to release his men. So he, he, escaped, he and the men escape, like Ulysses always did. Uh, so that's what he told me. I said, well, gosh, Dad, yeah, maybe that's what's going on. So what should I do? He said, well, why don't you come home? So I got on a bus, and when the bus came out of the, out of the uh, fog, I met God. I, God manifested himself to me. I mean, I, I can't explain. It's hard to explain what that's like, but uh, I remember th th this person. It was a person, not a human, but a person, very large and very old. I remember distinctly very old. Later, the Bible talks about the ancient of days. I didn't know that then, but that's what I, that's what I experienced, the ancient of days. But well, anyway, long story short, Joel remembers he came and picked me up, or picked up my stuff at the, at the uh, I went crazy, had a schizophrenic uh, breakdown. Uh, my poor dad was just crushed, like my, because it had happened to his brother, my uncle. And uh, so they, what am I gonna do? So they put me into the um, uh, place, uh, uh, Oregon City, mental hospital, this little hospital run by Dr. Voice, <laughs> who my dad knew through the wine thing somehow. And, uh, and uh, well, anyway, long story short, three weeks later, I, I kind of realized I, I, need to, I need to leave the place. And uh, um, as I've said many, to many people, I, I, my rea I never went back to reality, to my former reality. I came into a new worldview. The new worldview has God, of course, but also angels, demons, curses, blessings, resurrections from the dead, healings. That is my actually new worldview. Turns out that's a biblical worldview. I did not have that. I was a materialist. Um, and so I never went back. I went into something new. Uh, and I, I've been a, you know, 45 years later, I'm still a follower of Jesus. There you go. Um, well, uh, <laughs> so my dad, of course, watching all this, and I ended up uh, deciding to go through another story. It's not, I'm trying to tell my dad's story, not mine, but I ended up going to the University of Oregon to study anthropology because I was interested in cross-cultural mission work, which I eventually did. Uh, but um, while I'm there, I'm in the dorm room, because as a freshman, you had to live in the dorms, even though I was a bit older. And I was praying for my parents. And I, it was a Sunday, and I got down on my bed, knees, and I was praying for them. You know, what's it going to take God for my parents to also come to faith? And I had the distinct impression from the Holy Spirit that uh, he said to me, well, I'm going to need to take their vineyard the winery, for them to be able to come to faith. And I couldn't pray that, Joel. You couldn't what? I couldn't pray it. That they were going to... That they, okay, God, take their wine. If that's what it would take for my parents to come to faith, take their winery. I couldn't pray it. So I went to church, and I don't know what was preached, but I came back and I thought, okay, I, I got to do this. So I got on my knees, and I said, okay, God, if that's what it's going to take, then yes take their winery, their vineyard, their whole dream, their life. I mean, that's what he was asking me to put on the line for them. Uh, after that, all these things cascaded, and they were, eight months later, they were out of the winery. <laughs> and uh, so you can, you can look at it from a business point of view, what happened, but I, of course, I look at it from a spiritual perspective. It had become an idol. Many things in our lives become idols. Uh, there's a famous letter from the Apostle, uh, Apostle John, and the very last verse of this letter, he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Um, we're all, well, well there, what's, there's that, what the, the, the Bob Dylan song, you know, you gotta serve somebody. You, that, you're gonna serve something, and it's either going to be the Lord or it's going to be an idol. And so they'd become an idol. And even in, for me, I mean, you know, I, I was a strong Christian already. I mean, I'd been wonderfully converted and, and saved, but uh, I couldn't let it go that easily. I had to, like, 
really process what it meant. Because I knew, something told me if I prayed this, I mean, I knew I, something was gonna happen, and it did. <clears throat> My dad did eventually uh, come to faith. I have a wonderful letter here, which I would like to read into the record, if I may. <laughs> he said, so, this is what he wrote to me, Joel. Uh, my dad. Um, Christmas. Oh, that's Shirley's. That's Shirley's. Oh, maybe I don't have it. That's. Oh, no. Yeah, here it is. He said, uh, Dear Charlie, after your mother, you are the first to know. I have invited Jesus into my heart. I believe in him as the Son of God and my Savior. So I've struggled and thrashed around, God knows, but I am now committed to Jesus. The etymology of the word Savior is interesting, one who makes one safe. And the Latin safe means to make healthy or to make whole. As an arrogant, prideful man, I have already probed the potentials of humanism and existentialism but concluded long ago the horrible limits called despair such man-conceived ideas lead to. However, as you know, even with that understanding, I had been unwilling to make that great fearful leap of faith in Jesus. Well, I did, finally. May you go with Jesus, dear boy, your loving father, dad. That still chokes me up. <laughs> uh, sorry. No, no. That's but a pretty powerful letter. Yeah, it's so powerful. He eventually became a priest in the Orthodox Church. It turns out, I didn't realize it at the time, that the name Khoury is a uh, Lebanese family, Khoury. Uh, it comes from Lebanon. And the Khouris are a Marianite Christian. And a Khoury is a priest, probably from the French curé during the, 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 the Crusades. They came over and converted Arabs mm. to Christianity. And so, <laughs> full circle somehow, my dad ends up becoming an Orthodox priest in the Gallican Rite, anyway. Uh, but that was later, uh, that was later <clears throat> in his journey. And uh, so they, they were, <clears throat> so they were kicked out of the, out of the wine, out of the, the wine thing. But there was a period there <clears throat> where Tepla invested, and that's where they got the stainless steel tanks, yeah. and started going for it. Um, but my dad was a was was tough. He was a tough guy. He he, I would say. I mean, he had a tremendous integrity. He was an, you could even feel there's an integrity, there's honest, even a self awareness. But the one thing he lacked, I think, uh, was kindness. It's interesting. Uh, I grew up in a family, a loving family in many ways, but they weren't kind. It's kind of curious. I, I, I mean, I, I, like he really reached out to your brother. Uh, yeah. And, and, but it was kind of a, I don't know whether it's generation, you know, kind of tough love. Tough love would be a way I would describe yes. it. Yes. Tough love. That was my dad. Tough love. That maybe it was a generation thing, uh, the male yeah. generation. Your dad kind of was tough love. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so maybe it was maybe it was cultural. I don't know. But kindness isn't one. It's taken me years to realize. You know, the loving kindness. Kids I, that were grew up in the depression <clears throat> had tough love. Yeah. That were raised at that time. I just I think. Uh, no. Yeah. Grape vines are very forgiving as a plant. Like this year is one of those years where they are suffered a loss, the frost, for instance, and then they will come back, you know, with their other buds and whatnot and give something. We're going to get something. We're going to have a crop. But the wine business, as Charlie has just described, is not forgiving. Hmm. It is not forgiving at all. You will suffer a loss and you will lose. So grape growing, grape wine sales business is not forgiving at all. But the plants themselves are very forgiving. <laughs> That's a neat analogy. Yeah, business is, business is tough. People, 
You know, they have an interesting stat. They, they ask the average American, you know, when, what, do, what do companies make? What's their net income percentage? The, the average answer was 30 percent. Oh, of what? 30 percent. To survive. No, 30 percent net income. It's when the average, you ask the American, yeah, because they always think capitalists are wealthy and, and, and so they think they're, they're making 30 percent net profit. I don't profit. think so. That, well, exactly. <laughs> Anybody who's been in business, the average is 5 percent. It's hard. Being in business is rough. It's a, it's a constant battle to, to be profitable. Yeah. <clears throat> Ask any business owner. That's that's like. But right. the average American doesn't realize that. They just think they're all. They just think you're cutting a big. Yeah, you're big, gob of cream rich, off the yeah, top. Yeah, AOC. Of like they're all these rich capitalists. Yeah, it's just. Uh, but um, nothing against AOC. I don't want to. Uh, so anyway, so he, he, that was really his, uh, his journey. I did ask my parents, I told them this story once, and my mom goes, oh, after they came to, oh, no, God wouldn't ever do that. So I, I never brought it up again. Yeah, God will do that. Yeah. Sorry, God can be, there's some tough love on his side, too. Uh, but he's kind. That's the one difference. He, his, he's tough, but he's always kind. So my, so my parents, uh, that was sort of their, their journey, their exit out of, the wine business. I mean, how, how did they react to to losing to being pushed out of the business? To how, what was their what was their reaction to that time of their life? Well, there was um, there were two there were two periods. The period when they were really in financial straits after the lawsuit uh, that was extremely stressful for them because they. My dad told me later he even contemplated suicide, which is ironic. Um, because his great, his own grandfather committed suicide over financial ruin. So th th that may be in a, yeah, I, I don't know what that all means. But um, uh, they, they started walking a lot. I remember they just walked. I, a lot of this I was in France mm -hmm. studying. <clears throat> but then, but then Tepla came through. And I think, I think, uh, they got money for their shares. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got bought out. They were forced out, so they got money. So they, I remember my dad put money into gold, and it like doubled. He put it right. <laughs> so he put, he, he made a bunch of money on gold. Uh, I don't know why he put it in gold, but it, it, it doubled in like eight months after he bought it, mm -hmm. gold. But uh, so they had money. So that eased the, the, the pain a little bit, but I think it was definitely a, identity crisis, so that's when Joel talked about water. Mm -hmm. So he immediately, need, I felt like he immediately needed to go out and prove himself again. Mm -hmm. Rescheme. Rescheme, yeah. So instead of sort of taking a little bit slow, but that but that's, was part of his, his journey um, of, of faith, because he had actually started <clears throat> Cartwright Brewing Company, uh, in that period, down in uh, East uh, Portland. With John Niemeyer's building. John Niemeyer now is a, port, is a partner in the Northwest Wine Company and a part owner in Highland Vineyards. Huh. And he rented, your dad rented the old Pepsi building. For this from old, him? From him, yeah. Oh. I would have sworn the guy he rented it from was older, but he did not. My dad really pissed him off. John Neymar. Apparently. Yeah, because so, there was yeah. no, he had, man, as soon as my dad was on arrears one month, he was evicted. Um, Do you know where he got the idea? Like, what, was, was the brewing just a natural thing from wine, or was it something that came to him differently? No, because he saw the need. It was almost like, it was before, um, at that time, McMiniman was running, a, there was a bar downtown on the, on the east side. Produce Row, do, do you remember that? Produce Row was a bar you could go in. I was out of college. You could go down there and there was a million beers and bottles. That was at McMinimum, I didn't know this. McMinimum owned that. And that's where he got the idea to start a brewery was your dad was making beer. And your dad was mad. No one would buy beer with, uh, that was dirty. That well, that was, was unfiltered. 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 Unfiltered beer. IPA is a muddy beer, and it just 
piss your dad off to no end. Yeah. And he was going, that's the way it's supposed to be. But no one, w and it's hard to filter beer because it's under pressure and you got to use a special filter and they're really expensive. But he's going, that's the way it's supposed to be. He poured out there and it had, it yeah, was, yeah, it was, it was yeah. the, the dirty, I mean, whatever. It wasn't, yeah. wasn't clean, uh, you know, Olympia beer, you know. And then so it yeah. really frustrated him. Yeah. It was so, IPA style or, you know, yeah. funky. Yeah. So and that's what he, that's what they. It, was, it didn't taste bad. It just, um, it was just cloudy and it really frustrated him. And of course, what, five years later, everybody was making cloudy IPA beer and selling millions of gallons of it. So. Yeah. So I think, I think it was part of that high tech, high touch. He saw the need and he wanted, he, he had the whole vision for a brew pub because you couldn't sell beer from your brewery when he started and he, he, he contacted And the laws changed. The laws started to change too. The beer... Well, they had to push on it. They had to push on the OLCC. My dad contacted them and started that and then Ponzi and those guys came along and... Came and changed the laws. Changed the laws. So you could come in and you're making beer over here and you got a table over here and you could high tech, high touch. You can drink your beer and look at the tank and... I smell mean, the... You smell it. Yeah, but I mean... Yeah. You couldn't have any... minimums, you go and they got a, t a hose running from the tank over to the bar and you go six bucks you know I mean it was it was like a wine going from the tank over to the and then charge you by the glass I mean it's on the first time I saw that I thought is that even legal you know I mean it's that's profit that is what that is that is profit yeah no so, no bottle no yeah. label no cork yeah Shh. yep so my my dear mom went with him into that adventure I mean she she clean the come the, crawling out of a beer tank out of a beer tank and old, old a lot of dairy they used a lot of dairy stuff and uh, but he was going to go big time you know he wasn't you know you know sort of Dave Ramsey's baby step out of into wealth that was not my dad he was going to go He's big or run go Gallo home. out of Oregon yeah <laughs> they, go, yeah, they he was sold 50 percent of the wine in the state of Oregon he was going to Buying grapes and from Washington and from Sa from Sagemore and bringing them down was yeah, his he, gig. Yeah, yeah, no, he was it was a go big or go home kind of guy, uh, which you know pretty high risk mm -hmm. from a business point of view. I mean, some people can pull it off, but that's a tough one. So, um, and I, I don't know that that why the psychology of go big or go home. I don't know. I think there's a wonderful book by Michael Novak called uh, Business is a Virtue. And it's interesting, the three virtues, he, he's sort of a Catholic theologian, philosopher guy. And uh, the three virtues that he suggests business people bring are uh, innovation, um, practical realism. You know, you, to run a business, you gotta be practical. But the third is community building. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a Greek word that we translate from the New Testament fellowship. In Greek, it's called koinonia. Koinonia is Greek for basically business relationships. They're real. They're not, they're, they're a little bit two-dimensional. They're not three-dimensional like our family, personal relationships or friendship. But they are real. They're a two-dimensional I mean, you build buildings with two-dimensional business uh, plans. You can do a lot with two dimensions. And they're real. You know, you get very close, and then when your business stops, you actually never see the piece people again, even though you worked intimately for years together. It's just, just a curious re reality, but it's a real, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, real, a real relationship. So um, I think that was one of my dad's weaknesses. He, was, he struggled to make business, commu business relationships that could hang together. He was a tough guy to be a partner with. And I think that if I had to say, so he's brilliant in many ways, um, and even the finance side, I don't think it was his biggest weakness. You know, how, you know, people say he's a bad businessman. I don't think he was a bad businessman. I think he didn't know how to foster. Mm -hmm. He was arrogant. And sometimes people who are really smart don't have patience to bring people along. And, the, and he was kind of like that. He saw what he wanted, and if you can't see it, then you're just 
like what's wrong with you? Certainly ahead of his time in, in both. Well, at years. that time, the banks didn't really understand the wine industry. I mean, now you have much better opportunities for banking, financing in the wine industry. And <laughs> yeah. there was the, that didn't exist. The banks, what? Wine industry <laughs> in Oregon? That didn't happen. Now there's multiple opportunities to find banking needs in the wine industry and has been for 15 years. It did not exist in the 70s. You were a foreign entity. Yes, that's a really so true. I mean, people didn't know what to do. It was like there was a TV show called Green Acres. And it felt like Green Acres. It was right? Green Acres. That's it was exactly Green Acres. right. Like you were a foreign entity. You, you yes. weren't a strawberry grower or a wheat grower or Prune something grower. unknown. Or, yeah, something that was known. You were truly, that, that didn't happen here until. Yeah, you're like, what are in these In the 90s, people? maybe even later than that. Yeah. You were a foreign entity. Yeah. Yes, it's so true. <laughs> I mean, people, yeah, it was like, yeah, it just, it was didn't know what to make of these people trying to grow grapes. Because you remember, people didn't drink wine, so it wasn't, it didn't have that romance. It wasn't a sophistication. No. Until um, the Silicon Valley was, bank was one of the first ones to recognize his inventory as a value. Key Bank came in and then um, Farm Credit Services. Is, I mean, just to use those three examples of banks that saw value in, um, in the industry. Mm -hmm. The, I'm going to use the number, I'm not sure it's accurate, the wages in Yamhill County, and I don't know if this is currently correct, annually in Yamhill County are over a hundred million dollars now. I think it might be closer to 120. Um, in just in the wine business? In the wine, winery, labor, and vineyard labor only. That doesn't count hotels and restaurants and anything. That, that is a staggering, cool. staggering contribution to this. You talk about community. Yeah. That's yeah. unreal. So this used to be Hewlett Packard, this building. They left. What was it replaced by? It was replaced by um, the wine industry. If you go to a county in the Lama Valley that doesn't have the wine industry it active, really active in it, what does that downtown look like? It's not as vibrant as ours, even though ours is all tasting rooms and restaurants. It's just, but um, the, <laughs> so don't forget the teas. Pardon me. Don't forget boutique shops. Yeah, yes. but I'm just saying it's it doesn't it's it's shuttered, mm -hmm. and it's uh, on the it's shuttered and it's it's we have good agriculture here and we have uh, you know you got university here also, but. Um, it's different if you go into those communities that don't have it. And I'm not saying we're the savior or whatever, but it's just if you don't have a hundred million dollars in labor going on in your county, it's it's staggering what's happened, the growth here. It's, yeah, especially it's, especially the more rural, the rural peripheral counties. Yeah, yeah, you're it's right. it's really phenomenal. So I went up there a few years ago, and this picture kind of touches on that. We've talked a little bit about the varieties and I think that it really is 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 interesting that um, so if you I was sort of struck by the vineyard itself that it's um, the way it's laid out and um, the varieties that are up there are and we talked a bit a bit about this that your dad chose the varieties that are up there that are still um, and always have been for 55 years, like we said, are still doing really well and, the, and making great wines for the whole time. And so if you go up there and you look at the vineyard itself, um, like in this picture, the layout is just perfect. Um, and you come, I, I came home from that visit and you open up the book, General Viticulture, which is uh, published in 1962. Right. This is his textbook from uh, uh, Dr. Winkler and Dr. Cleaver and Lloyd Leiter and to the, the trellis chapter. That's that. Yeah. To the inch. And I just think it's, it's interesting architecturally. 
that it works. It's still working today. It's been modified. It's like remodeling sure. the old house, you know, or something. But it's just absolutely, um, I find it very interesting. Having been building vineyards for 40 some yeah. years, and it's just interesting. Well, yeah, I, I, it, Winkler, I think I it think was they spot a, on, and, yeah. and it was just that it's still working. It's still really, really functional. I just think that's n noted to be noted. Amazing. Yeah, Amazing. I think it's. I, I think too, it's, it's also the Alsatian method too. He that was pretty. No, no, that's Pendle Bogan pruning yeah. there. It's just yeah. these old. If you go up there today, there's still old, yeah. gnarly old vines are still up there pumping away. Yeah. You wouldn't, not, you know, it's just, I find it very, very interesting. Yeah. And you're not like, oh, well, we got to rip out that section because it's not working. No, it's still 50 some years later, it's still working. It's, oddly, it's not gone phylloxera. I, I think it's fantastic. It's but, crazy. And so. Um, and I said, I asked him, but do you keep people from the vintage? No, no. It's just, fortunately, it's isolated enough that it doesn't have it. And it's very few, uh, uh, you know, examples of that. But yeah. it's just, it's striking that the, the architecturally, mm. for me, it's just like, oh, go home and open up General Vit. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there. Just well, yeah. To the letter. And it's, yeah. it's just very striking. So. Mm. I just. That's a 60 year old textbook. Pardon me? A 60 year old textbook that still is like dead Spot on. on. Yeah, I read it. Usually I read something out of there once a year. If you want to read fertilization or pruning, it's just like if you have a question, and I, I, um, Dr. Cleaver is kind of a personal friend I've got to know over the years, and he's retired now from, he even sold his own vineyard, but we, we talk every year or two. I didn't hear from him, and I thought I was worried, so I called him on the phone here last year, and, oh no, I'm okay, and, you know, he's retired completely and sold his farm, and, um, but he's doing okay, and he's in his late 80s, but um, he's a good guy. He's a friend of Werner's too, and yeah. so, but, um, just interesting to yeah. think about that, but I just yeah. He my, it's, it's one of my dad's favorite wine books, actually called this one. It's a French book. Uh, he he cracked that a lot um, when he was there. I mean, the Amarine was sort of the Davis textbook, but he he really liked yeah like this. But one. it's just I think it was. Yeah, yeah. So Corey Clone, that's that's a, a you know, that's still that's a name. I suppose if my dad has remembered, it's probably it's one. It's one thirty six. It's it's now been certified at Davis. Yeah, and it's Pinot Noir one thirty six. Yeah. So you know, there's there's a lot of uh, theories about how it came in, and Joel, Joel, I think Joel had a deeper talk with my dad than I did. I talked with him briefly about it once. Yeah. So why don't you share that? So I will story. a little bit. Um, he was a little concerned that he was going to get in trouble for doing, for, as he said it, in this short conversation we had, it was at a trade show in Sacramento when he used to work in the... Uh, ozone. Pardon yeah, me? With, with the ozone, ozone business. Yeah. We talked, I, and I, work, I work in the nursery business for Duarte Nursery, and we, ran, we talked for a minute. And so um, he did get it in Alsace. He, and I asked him which one was it. I didn't grab him by the throat and go, which is it? Um, he asked you, Glenn, they were at the, the clone yeah. block. Do Dr. Uglin, Pierre Uglin, who was the director of the research center. And he said, that one. And I said, why? And he said, that's the best one. <laughs> So that's what it is. So I have my theory which one it is because there's very few clones in the French book that came from Alsace, but um, nobody's ever DNA tested them. You can DNA test clones now, but yeah. Um, yeah. So he. It's a very good clone. It it works well. It makes beautiful wine on its own. Um, there's a few places where it's planted and um, on its own in, in blocks, and it, it's performed very, very well. And, and, and David Hill is, is one of those places, and there's other vineyards where um, it's done very, very well. I have a teeny bit at my house, and um, it's, it it's makes a distinct wine and very, very good. It's yeah. so uh, that's, beautiful clusters, and yeah. 
So that's how it came in from his time in Alsace, and uh, you know, was worked. propagated out and yeah. Um, yeah, whether whether there you you'd have to speak with David Alsace whether during the propagation in Curry, Charles Curry nursery, whether it, there was some mix-ups. There, there's 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 some potential that the some of the Curry clone got mixed. Mis mixed, misnamed, that kind of thing. But I don't know. I it, it's kind of a distinctive cluster size yeah. and stuff. So I don't. I don't think so. Well, not that you'd miss it. It's just that he was supposed to deliver Corey Clone, and it, the, some of the he was supposed to deliver something else. I think yeah, deliver Corey. And, 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 yeah, yeah. So it's, that's it's sort. Not, I don't really want to talk about. Yeah. It. I don't think that that. I don't think that that's a, a, a value. I think that. <laughs> I think that, that so there's that's in that's that's a rumor out there. Let's just put it. I think that's the how historical. It, there's enough of that as there is. Yes. Yeah, that you should have got this, but you got that instead. Right. I'm as I'm, as a nurseryman for 40 years. <laughs> like, well, it's a black grape. You yeah, it's know. Pinot. Like, <laughs> what do you want? You know. So, um, but it is. Uh, it's not. You didn't get something of lesser value. I think that you got something of equal or equal or better. Uh, um, and it is. A, it contributes, and it is distinctive. And so. Um, yeah, I it's it is interesting and it is standalone and it, it, it's now um, was submitted to Davis FPS and it's certified and it's clone 136 as a Corey clone. If you look on the National Grape Registry, so so there, so that's just, that's that's probably the best story. Yeah, uh, and, he, and he got it into the country. Well, he got it in in a back of his pants or something and in a suitcase <laughs> though my aunt swears that he told her he brought it in through the USDA in Berkeley but I don't believe that yeah. that's true yeah because I think he brought Gewurztraminer in at the same time yeah because the Gewurztraminer from your place is different hmm. then then at the time there wasn't in the early 60s do you know that there was only 200 acres of Chardonnay in the whole country. Nothing. In the whole United States, 200 acres of Chardonnay. There was nothing. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's, yeah, there was, the Gewurztraminer is different from up there, if you cluster wise. Um, I'm, I, I would almost put money that the, the Riesling is not from. Here, yes, <laughs> yeah. I but but what's interesting though is he obviously was thinking about you know he had already there wasn't any plant material here. You could get some mutt from Davis, or you could and a, a lot of people. He was not alone. There was a lot of things coming from uh, Europe by a lot of people. Um, he was not alone. And so it was, um, and, and fortunately, he was uh, aware of um, virus and plant material. He was an advocate of clean plant material. He did not go to your uncle's vineyard in Europe and potentially pick up plant diseases. He went to um, the, the, the research. research station vineyard, which was tested to the best capability at the time to get plant, clean plant material. And so, um, yes, it was not necessarily a, um, uh, a loud method of bringing plant material in, but it was not going out on the street and getting plant, you know, going to uh, Romani Conti at night and sneaking cuttings, which happened at the same time. There were other people that did things like that, or Chambertin. There are clones now that they go, oh, well, this was Chambertin. And, you know, my brother-in-law went over there and took some cuttings. And so that happened all the time. And now, you know, there's that happened. Yeah, all the time. So, yeah, questionably legal, but at least not cavalier. At least cavalier but, is a good word. Yeah. Yeah. Was, no, yeah. he was he was thoughtful about it. Yeah, he and he so he, he he was a follower of that sure. philosophy, but at the time you couldn't get it. That was the problem. One it, of those. Yeah, was it Semillon? Was the first Semillon in the United States? 
Or Shasla's maybe, I don't know. Yeah, there's not much Shasla. I mean, the Shasla's up there, but I don't, yeah, I mean, Shasla's FPS, but. Um, I don't know at the time. Pearl this is where you're, Pearl de Chubba maybe? I don't know where he got all these. If I can tell you where he got. <laughs> well, okay. I don't know if they had Pearl de Chubba at the at the it, research. No, center. not at that. Maybe they did. I don't know. They had a they had a big. Uh, Anyhow, so it was. Uh, of idols at that's the what center. I. That's how I understand the Corey clone came here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was not. He could not. That's why when I said you saw Uglan the. In the nursing home last year, I, you know, did you get him down? And <laughs> what's the number? You know, I mean, no, he was already a little too, too dangerous. He would never remember, sure. but that's why uh, I was just curious. I, I, I'd put my money on a certain clone because there's not in the French right. book of clones. There's only like one from Alsace, and yeah. so that's my that's my bet. Yeah, but uh, you'd have to use the DNA to find it. Yeah, they can do that now. Yeah. But it costs like eight thousand dollars to get some kind of deal. It's not worth the money. Yeah, well, it's a good clone. Yeah, they've got so it. So it's good it, with it's good for me. And, yeah, it works well here. The guys in California like it, and yeah. everybody likes it. It's a good one. It's one of the one of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess that's some. That, yeah, that's sort of the that's sort of the the journey. I mean, they they. It's a great you know, contribution. He, he did. Yeah. He did have. Um, uh, where is it? I think it's interesting talking about my dad and the the branding. Gosh, where is that? Of um, where is that? The branding of Oregon. I always I thought this was interesting. Uh, you know, this is this is a thing you can see his first label. Do you think I, it resembles the Oregon fruit label? Well, it did. I, absolutely. <laughs> he took Mark Gaylor's idea because he sold, this is the exact font and label from Oregon fruit products. So he went to Mark Gaylor's boss and said, hey, I, I want, I'd really like to use your And he Oregon. said it was okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead and use it. That's amazing. Let's see it. That's yeah. a cool label. So he, from the beginning, was going to push Oregon. I mean, that was, he, he saw the, the, Have you seen the desire to brand. Uh, partly, I mean, he had, he had sold Oregon fruit products, right? So he saw the, the power, value in the, the value word Oregon. In Oregon and, and, and that there, you could build a brand around Oregon wine, just like you did Oregon fruit. That's amazing. So it just all came together sort of serendipitously. It was a cool so, label. Yeah. So you, you touched a little bit already, but tell me a little bit about, about his life after the wine. Of yeah. Talk about beer and talk about him becoming yeah. a priest. So a lot yeah. Of yeah. So he he during his journey uh, in um, uh, into the brewery. So he decided to do in the microbrewery. Try to get push the. He had the vision for the brew pub. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a, a brewery that could sell beer, and he tried to put that. But he ran out of money. Uh, he couldn't, he had some technology problems. He tried to go too big. Instead of just going small baby steps and making it in his garage and, and building and getting really, he just put all his money into it and he ran out of cash. That was a big building. Yeah, ran out of cash before he could really s sell enough. And he irritated his landlord so that there was no grace and he booted him out. And so they ended up going bankrupt. Um, but it was during the brewery period that he had his conversion. He came to Christ, and they were attending. A, they, my mom had grown up in his Episcopalian, so they were Episcopals. But after they got, they went bankrupt because of the brewery debacle. Um, and that was that was you know that's hard on on anybody. Uh, not financially alone, but the psychological, the shame, you know, the embarrassment, the sense of failure. So they decided to move from Oregon, and they went to Calistoga, where my grandfather had been. And they, they loved the Napa Valley. The Napa Valley is a beautiful valley, and he had done a lot of research there. And so he settled in to Napa Valley, to Calistoga, and um, my mom uh, went back to nursing. She had her license had lapsed, but at like 65, she took the test and passed it. That was always a big 
accomplishment in her life. Uh, and so she went to, back to, she was a geriatric nurse and worked there. And then he opened a bicycle shop. So <clears throat> the first label was Charles Corey, that's his name. Cartwright was my mom's maiden name. So, so then his third business, he decided to take both of their middle names. So he started a bicycle shop called Jules Culver. His middle name is Jules, her middle name was Culver. <laughs> so around town, he was known as Jules. Uh, and so he started a bicycle shop and he did rentals and then he started a, uh, where you could go up on the hills of, and, and ride down. He, he, he tried different schemes. To, to do that. But at the same token, he got disenchanted with uh, the Episcopal Church. It was for him too liberal. And so he, Calistoga, it turns out, was a city where a lot of white Russians settled after the revolution. They came, the white Russians, through sh uh, Shanghai and then came to California. <clears throat> and so there was, there's kind of, a, yeah, there's several, orth, there's an Orthodox monastery there in Calistoga. There's a couple of Orthodox churches. And I, I think it just got him, like, interested in Orthodoxy. And so he ended up reading and, and, and realizing that he was interested in uh, Orthodoxy, the, the main Orthodox church, the OCA, the uh, Orthodox Church of America, mostly coming out of the Russian Orthodox. Uh, he got involved with that. And through that ended up, um, involved with a, another sort of church, uh, Orthodox church out of France, and through them he became uh, an ordained, uh, studied and became an ordained Orthodox church. Uh, had a ministry, and <laughs> my mom, he had a ministry with a bunch of drug addicts in, Ro um, in um, Santa Rosa. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> uh, my, my mom the things she, she, she would do with him. Uh, and uh, that didn't last too long. His health started to fail. He was a uh, diabetic, and uh, he just was running out of steam. Uh, and uh, so they were there, gosh, quite a few years. Um, she, she finally retired. Um, and then uh, she had a stroke. You know, but I never, I never saw my dad, my dad cry except one time in my whole life, and that's when he was telling me about her stroke. Yeah, really, uh, really shook him up. So he took care of her. She was bedridden. I mean, the whole works. You know, changing her diaper, the whole thing. Just became a had his apron, cooked, cleaned, paid the bills, did everything for four years, and finally we visited him, and he was a bit thinner. I mean, he looked good, but he had lost some weight. And it was like, why do you lose? Oh, I'm more exercising. Well, no, that wasn't the truth. Uh, so finally he called me up uh, around Memorial Day the following year and said, Charlie, uh, I've, I've ha I'm having a biopsy done on my lungs, on your lungs. Yeah, I might have lung cancer. So I jumped in a car and I drove down there. Well, he looked like a guy from Auschwitz. Like, what do you, like he had oxygen. Like, when were you gonna tell me, like, well, they haven't actually confirmed it's, it's cancer. Like, like, really? Well, they finally- Was after your mom died? No, 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 she was still, still living and he was taking care of her. And that was one of his big worries. Like, what is gonna happen to my mom if I'm going down? So um, I had to come back because we were negotiating to buy this business so, and work. So I came back. And uh, he started failing and needed to go into the hospital. So they had a helper, and she said to Cheryl, look, to my mom, look, Shirley, if you want to be with him, uh, this would, you need to let him know you're having a heart attack. So you, they haul you both off. So she said, yeah, she told him she was having a heart attack. So they hauled them both off into a rest home. And so then we, I drove down, and he died three weeks later. Yeah. What year? Uh, 2004. So it's kind of interesting on a personal note because we were, um, he, I was back and forth because we were negotiating with my former employer to buy his, into his business, my partner, my, my, his managers. 
because uh, he was in financial straits due to some investments in real estate. And <clears throat> so my wife and kids went down to, he didn't have a will, my mom didn't have a will, they had to get their affairs in order and because uh, he's going downhill. So then I came down um, and uh, they put him together in the um, same convalescent room and I was there when he died. And then they'd had some pre-planned thing, the, the um, Neptune society, you know, where they take care of you. So the guy comes in and says, you know, they can only be here for four hours. Uh, do you have any arrangements? Yeah, yeah, I think it's the Neptune Society. Okay, yeah, so they come in. So Karen calls me the next morning. Well, it wasn't the Neptune Society. It was the, uh, but some very similar name. Mm -hmm. So they, I, my dad had hold off on the wrong, cost me 256 bucks to get his body back. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> stop, you have my dad, you got him in the wrong freezer. Uh, so anyway, so I did get him back, and then uh, and then we had the funeral. That was funny. I remember uh, he had this great this song my kids liked. It went, uh, "Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Jesus Christ is my great chum. Hallelujah, it is true. Jesus loves me. Yes, he do." <laughs> he would he would sing that to them. So they sang that at his funeral, and. Uh, there were a variety of people who came, and uh, he he had. It was interesting. All these different names. Like he had this. He would tease. He, they had this little thing at Christmas where he would get this. My mother would get a, a beautiful ring or some beautiful jewelry with a note from Al Schwartz, and basically Al would write to her and say, ah, "When are you going to leave that bum, Chuck?" and come away with me, you know what a scoundrel he is. Well, of course, that was his joke. Well, one time, apparently, my grandmother didn't know it was a joke. <laughs> she was shocked that my mother was still getting jewelry from some former lover or something. <laughs> yeah, well, that was my, so he had all these names, you know, Charles Corey, Cartwright Brewing, Jules Culver, Al Schwartz, it was, it was funny. That was the, they had a funny, funny humor. Um, and my mom had lost her voice, really. She would could, uh, talk, but she that day, I remember she said a whole sentence in her old voice on the, on the funeral day. And so then we had to leave and to continue, finish this negotiation to buy into this business, and they fired us. Uh, they had brought in, independent to our knowledge, a whole other investor who decided out with these managers. And so they, we, I came, drove all the way back, leaving my mom in this rest home, to, to try to finalize this deal, and they fired us. So we come out of the accountant's office where he negotiated my two other, three other partners. What are we going to do? And I said, we're going to start a wood ceiling company. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. <laughs> so we, we started the wood ceiling dis business. And I've, I've wondered if, I don't know, my dad's little anointing kind of like, I guess now it's my turn. Possessed you. <laughs> well, it's just now it's my turn to go do it, I, I guess. Uh, it's kind of interesting that week was so, I don't know, just significant week. That, Because he was always bugging me to go, you should quit that guy, you know, he's no good, you should start your own company. He was always prodding me, and sure enough, after he died, uh, started it. That was a one crazy, crazy month or two. Um, and then my mom passed away uh, about nine months later. We brought her up to Oregon, and uh, and she passed away. Um, yeah, she would have been 100 and 101. What? She would have been 101 this year, 19, well, 102 actually. Last year she would have been 100 years old. Uh, 1921 to it, it's so crazy. Um, yeah, and I think. Uh, I remember when I, yeah, so I, th I think that that's sort of the, I don't know if there's any, any other real stories to tell about my dad and the vineyard and. I have one more, one more yes. sort of just a prompt question Please. here to take it wherever you want to go, but you mentioned kind of 
his legacy as you as you know it, the, the Corey clone being a big part of it, if, if people know the name, that's a lot of what they know. What do you think his legacy is in Oregon wine? What, what role did he play in the industry and, and how would you kind of like him to be remembered for his time in the industry? Well, I, this is, you know, for me, I, I feel like he was, and I think, I think like somebody like Dave Adelsheim says this similar thing. I think he was the intellectual foundation for the Oregon wine industry. That he, he had the theoretical, he thought about it from this climate point of view. It doesn't mean others, many others had many other contributions, but I think that, you know, as, as Dave Adelsheim said, yeah, we, we had his, we had his, we had his thesis. Nobody read it, but we had it. And it was like, kind of, we knew there was somebody who had some sort of scientific thoughtfulness behind it. Even though it doesn't actually mention Oregon in here, there was this, it was the varietal selection based on it. So I think that that was, that, that cold limit amelioration idea, hypothesis that he, as he called it. I think that's the, the, the piece. I think there were people who made better wine. Um, um, there are people that did a lot of things better than he did, but I think that's how I would like to think of him. Um, and, and obviously with Dave, one of the early pioneers, Richard Summers, of course. Richard was so faithful with his little barre, he'd always wear a barre, and he'd drive all the way from Roseburg, all the way up to attend these. <laughs> he was very faithful. He was an interesting guy. He was definitely a quirky guy. Yeah, yeah he was definitely quirky. But um, he was faithful. They were all I trying. got to kind of know him when I worked with Irie when they would put the wine tables at different tastings alphabetically and so I was the E and then there was there wasn't no G or an H and and then <laughs> he was H and so he was just a couple of there'd be like no table in between us and so we would talk a little yeah. bit. I kinda of know him over the years. So he was a really nice guy. He really yeah. smart. He was quiet but Yeah, yeah, the wheels were turning for sure. Yeah. 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 But it was, again, people coming. But I'd say I think that, for me, is that, that sort of the theoretical or... Well, your dad was really serious. He was a leader. Yeah. And there are followers. And, and Chuck Curry was a leader. He was yeah. smart. He had ideas. Yeah. And... Because um... I, I think it is interesting how concepts are powerful. Mm -hmm. People can follow a concept. Uh, and, and people struggle to follow when there's either a too obscure or complex concept. So I think they, it, it allowed them to galvanize around a concept. It, this is, we're not just doing hippie back to nature. There's something real here that we're trying to achieve. And uh, um, I think that was important to them. You know, I remember, he, but he was like that. I mean, like, I remember we got into, and when I was in high school, we got into Marshall McLuhan. He was very, very smart. And he was, if, if he wasn't the first, he was one of the first. I mean, you can argue first all day long. It's a, it's a foot race, and, you know, what separates the string? Who broke the string? I don't know. But um, he was in the first, uh, first group of people that ran the race. And so... Um, they were a good group of guys. Yeah. Erath, yeah. Ponzi, yeah. Corey Lett, Richard Summers, and um, they were the guys, so. Yeah, it is kind of amazing that there were like no vineyards in the Willamette Valley. No what? No vineyards in the Willamette Valley. There it weren't just, any vineyards, and just, so they did that. So, today that and they did that. And they were really, was, it worked. Yeah. And so they had to be, um, and, and all the guys at Davis told them they were crazy. It's going to, you're going to lose. Yep. And they did it anyhow. They moved their families up here with nobody. They weren't um, millionaires from no, Silicon nobody Valley. Nobody money. was a millionaire from Silicon Valley or trust funders from somewhere with yep. gobs and gobs of money. They were all stone broke. Uh, working full-time jobs, yeah. uh, raising and dragging their kids up here and their wives up here, and living in rental homes um, and, yeah. and 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 planting grapes, um, and th three out of five had Davis educations. Um, yeah, Fuller. Fuller had a, Fuller was educated and actually worked in the wine business. He did. He was he he graduated with my dad. But I don't know what he did for a living up here. 
Nothing. I think Malkmus, they, they went, they had enough money. They had money. Could focus. They had money. But, um, Malkmus was probably the first who brought some money. First guy with money. But um, so it's, again, it's part of the mercy part. There's no mercy. You know, start any business, there's no mercy. And so. No, that's true. So. Yeah, the market's pretty amoral. Yeah, you know. It's, there's no mercy. And you go home and you don't have any food to put on the table, there's no mercy there either. So, I mean, it was... Yeah. There was no equipment. You know, there wasn't any vineyard equipment. You had to go trying to dream up something to make, to grow grapes. Um, there wasn't, they made, uh, the trellis material came from the, the bean industry, the green bean industry was, was ending and that was where the trellis material came from, was the end of the string bean industry, mm. using the split cedar posts from the green bean industry and the, um, the wire that came out of the green bean industry yeah. was like, if no one really knows that, the contribution of the green bean industry to the viticulture. Yeah. I mean, it was garbage, and so the grape growers swooped it up, you know? Yeah, I, do, I, I mean, I remember making so many posts with um, creosote and diesel, and we'd have barrels Yeah, soak in your own soak posts your out own. of pedochlorophenol yeah. and, yeah. and uh, creosote. Yeah. Really good for your body. Yeah, when you're <laughs> 14 years old. 14 years old, let's go dip some posts, you know, and uh, yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, I, that's, that's sort of okay. probably the answer. Excellent. Well, I, I, I really didn't ask any questions, but I don't really have any more questions. Yeah. Is there anything else you feel like needs no. to be part of the... He's a leader. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, I greatly, greatly appreciate this. This was a, a really wonderful uh, to hear from both of you about your memories of him and kind of your interactions of, and of course the way it impacted both of your lives as well. So thank you so much for sharing all that with us. and. I'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Thanks. Okay.